Yes, Mr. Tyler Durden, is it? Well, you've been a problem for some time now. I've been looking forward to meeting you. Fight Club is a very unique movie, and I particularly enjoy it. One of the great things is that it came out in 1999, and it was directed by David Fincher. So it came out right on the edge of the new millennium. And it's one of those movies where people misunderstand the villain and think he's the good guy. So they end up idolizing the villain. And this leads to all kinds of problems. And it's something that the director himself, Fincher, actually really had to correct people on. Although it can mean anything to anyone, the only person whose opinion on this matters is Fincher, the person who put it all together and directed it. Now, I'm sure many of you are probably aware that David Fincher ended up creating this character, Tyler Durden, who ended up becoming a symbol for the far right. Now, he has appeared as a symbol, a profile image for many right-wing blogs, for uh, many people who think this, have this idea of reject modernity, return to tradition, uh, has uh, ended up in a lot of conspiracy theory type individuals who's idolized and a lot of right-wing people really identify with him. And Victor has done a, a great deal to completely distance himself from these individuals because they're not what he was trying to say. They're not what he identifies with. And he has very specifically said the opposite of what these people are trying to say. He said, it's impossible for me to imagine that people don't understand that Tyler Durden is a negative influence. I don't know how to respond, and I don't know how to help them. Tyler Durden has become a symbol of the far right, and he represents a lot of the false ideas that a lot of them hold very near and dear to them, themselves. And a lot of this social Darwinism, a toxic conception of masculinity, I'm not talking about toxic masculinity as a generalized, a general idea that's largely misused by liberals and a lot of people on the left. I mean a toxic conception of masculinity. There is a non-toxic masculinity. So there is a positive and a negative form of masculinity. And when dealing with a lot of people who use the term toxic masculinity, I would ask them, do you have an example of non-toxic or positive masculinity? And if they can't give you one, then they really are saying that all masculinity is toxic. So I would end up not listening to them. And there's also the very much the social Darwinist aspect. Everybody goes into these fights and they prove themselves like the toughest man wins or the, the, the survival of the fittest, the strongest survive. Except that these concepts, these uh, very social Darwinist concepts, you know, really aren't real. They're completely either misunderstood to the point where they no longer mean what the people who created them were actually intending. They end up being exactly what the Nazis had changed them into meaning, which is why the people who advocate nonsense like this end up getting called Nazis and then get angry at being called Nazis. The real meaning of the survival of the fittest is being able to survive and pass off genes. It doesn't mean someone who can punch other people in the face. That's complete nonsense. That's, that's needless and meaningless barbarity. In fact, all the entire science of both sciences, of both psychology and sociology, prove the pretty much the opposite of the nonsense ideas that the Nazis put forward to justify genocide. The one thing that we know scientifically has allowed the human race to survive is cooperation. That is the one thing that has allowed us to overcome everything in our history, every threat that has ever been given to the human race. Every, every catastrophe that we have ever overcome has been a result of cooperation and empathy towards those who have been hurt. And Tyler Durden represents the opposite of that. He represents a lack of empathy. 
He represents a very angry inner child that doesn't want to be told what to do, doesn't want to be told what to say or how to behave as a rational person in a modern society. And this is not to say that, that the modern day capitalism doesn't have its failings, that modern society doesn't have things that are wrong with it. But this isn't necessarily what Tyler Durden represents or what even the, the director who put this all together was even trying to say. Fincher said that Fight Club was a coming of age film, but for people in their thirties, Fincher described the narrator as an everyman. Fincher outlined the narrator's background. He's tried to do everything he's taught to do, tried to fit into the world by becoming the thing he isn't. This is another way of saying you grow up, you do everything that you're supposed to do, and life doesn't turn out the way that you're told it's going to. Now, this is something that a lot of us who lived through those times to experience myself being one of them. Now, uh, again, in 1999, I was only 18 years old. And we, at that time, even those of us who were only in our late teens, did notice how much, very much the world was changing, not just on the global political landscape with uh, no longer having the alternate superpower of the Soviet Union, Soviet Union there as a competing global force, but what had changed as a result of the NAFTA agreement that began the great uh, deindustrialization of the United States. And, and make no mistake, this happened in Canada as well. When the good union jobs that people had lived off of for decades since, since essentially the end of the Second World War were being dismantled. And the real impact of that was just starting to be felt. This was also the time when when you went to school for IT and you and you learned all the IT skills, this is when the, the beginning of the dot-com bubble, everybody was going to go out and learn IT and, and computers were going to be the future. And make no mistake, certainly computers did become the future and we certainly do live that future now. The thing is, they had overestimated when it was going to happen and they had overdeveloped, overemphasized the role of technology that eventually in 2000, uh, about mid 2000, there was the great dot-com bubble that burst. And all of these people who had run out and gone to IT school to specifically learn how to run servers and be the IT guy in massive, massive unprecedented numbers suddenly found themselves unemployed with a skill that was not in demand. And all of these companies went completely out of business. And there was a massive contraction of this particular industry almost overnight. And then there was a great disillusionment because of that. And even at that time, people who were in their early 30s, who now found themselves without those union jobs that people had expected to find because for decades they had always been there. And we were told, don't worry, this won't lead to people losing jobs. This will just create more jobs in Mexico and help create, help alleviate poverty in Mexico when, when if you actually look at the statistics, it actually doubled poverty in Mexico because it forced a lot of Mexicans, uh, particularly the indigenous, off their land by getting rid of Article 13 of the Constitution. And that kicking indigenous people off of their land led to the rise of the Zapatistas, hence the Rage Against the Machine song. Rage Against the Machine song, everything can change on a New Year's Day. And this was the great upheaval that people were starting to face. This is when the overload of credit was starting to take over as a greater tendency of the rate of profit to fall and a greater reliance on purchases made through credit as credit cards became easier and easier to get and a greater reliance on them to purchase a lot of the consumer goods. And this is, was, was before manufacturing was sent to China and the turnover rate on the consumption of consumer commodities increased as a result of cheaper production and what a lot of people claim is a planned obsolescence.
at the beginning of the movie, what you have is the Edward Norton character, the narrator, suffering from insomnia. And with insomnia, it is a repeated difficulty falling asleep or, or staying asleep. Approximately 10% uh, of the adult population suffers from an insomnia disorder, and another 20% uh, experiences occasional insomnia symptoms. Women, older adults, and people with socioeconomic hardships are more vulnerable to insomnia. Insomnia is often a chronic condition with 40% persistence rate over a five-year period. They're part of REM sleep that you need is that there's a repairing of the neural pathways in the brain. Now, this takes a lot of the experiences that you have during the day and sort of categorizes it and shoves it away into your long-term memory. And if, if you don't get enough sleep, this uh, filing away of memories, this repairing of neural connections simply just doesn't happen. So you end up having severe memory issues, and this affects a lot of other things as well. This also uh, tends to cause a great deal of irritability. And the main cause of the irritability is that the neural connections between the amygdala and the brain, which deals primarily with the emotions in this case, and the frontal lobe, which does a lot of the judgment, the, the thinking, the decision making, the neural connections between the two uh, have decayed to some degree. They haven't been repaired as they normally do that you would get with the REM sleep. So the, the connection between the part of you that makes rational decisions and your emotional center is essentially damaged. And that's why you get upset when you haven't had enough sleep and you tend to, you know, snap at people. You don't react properly and you realize, oh, I, I'm, I'm being irrational and I, I'm sorry, I need to get more sleep. It's not just that you're more irrational because you feel terrible. It's because literally the, the connection between your emotional center and your thinking, you know, judging and your, your cognitive abilities is literally damaged and not being repaired as it normally would on a daily basis. Uh, th this can also have other effects on the brain. It uh, also has the effect of creating uh, delusions that come from damaged connections. If you stay up long enough, and some studies suggest that even if you're just awake for 24 hours straight, you can have enough to start experiencing auditory and visual hallucinations, which certainly does explain why in the movie, the narrator, uh, Edward Norton, begins to start seeing Tyler Durden everywhere, why he begins to see little flashes of him, why he starts seeing him in different places. I mean, this to a degree really can happen if you don't get enough REM sleep for your mind to actually get that repairing that it needs. And there is, there are some studies that you can find that do suggest that a lack of sleep, it can actually create a kind of actual psychosis that can actually end up being very dangerous for a person. One of the things I thought was very interesting from the film was the depiction of subliminal messaging. And this occurred very early in the movie where we see those flashes of Brad Pitt and the character of Edward Norton talks about subliminal messaging and whatnot. And I think it's important to say that subliminal messaging is complete nonsense. It's complete and absolute nonsense. There is no such thing. All of this stems from an alleged study from 1957, where a guy, James Vicar, uh, allegedly put the subliminal messages into movies. Eat popcorn, drink Coke. And then he played the movies at a local theater and then claimed that there was a 60% rise in Coke and popcorn sales. The problem was, is that about two years later, he eventually came out and admitted he never did the study. So for decades, there has been this paranoia about subliminal messaging that has been, been based on complete and utter nonsense. I mean, psychiatrists have been dealing for years with uh, patients who have been absolutely paranoid that they have been programmed subliminally. There have been endless and endless conspiracy theorists who have written massive amounts about subliminal messaging being used to control people. And a, a lot of this spread because popular media at the time in the late 50s 
and a good deal into the 60s were putting it out, uh, the idea that uh, Americans were being abducted by Soviet agents and then they were being brainwashed with subliminal messaging and then to be sleeper agents and that they would get a call in the middle of the night and that would be a key phrase that would activate them to go and try to kill the president or something. And this reoccurring theme throughout American movies reinforced that kind of false belief in people's minds. And then, of course, further experiments started being done with subliminal messaging in universities and, and whatnot to actually try to verify this because it became something that was very frightening. And so this reinforced it even more. If the universities are experimenting with it, then therefore it must be real in the minds of many people. And this this just reinforced that boogeyman in people's minds to an extreme degree. Although I, I think it's, it's uh, very interesting that when this fear of subliminal messaging came out, uh, the guy who did it, um, James Vicar, said, admitted that he did it so that he could boost his own profile and get jobs in the advertising industry. The, the governments of, I believe, the UK, Canada, and Australia immediately banned subliminal messaging from being put into anything. However, the US government uh, only did ban it to some degree, but left the door open for it to be legally used in other situations that was very ill-defined. In other words, the U.S. government did still believe to some degree that subliminal messaging could work. And then this did play into uh, a, a lot of what went on during the MK Ultra experiments. And yes, despite popular sentiment, MK Ultra actually did exist. And the files on MK Ultra uh, can, can actually be found on the CIA website. You can actually go and get them. Another interesting piece is there was a study done by the State University of California where they took 82 grad students and they did an experiment about backwards messages. Do you remember that big scare in the 60s where the Beatles, Kiss, or what have you were putting backwards messages by Satan inside of songs to try to program people to, I, I don't know, make them hate Jesus or something? Well, they did an experiment with those grad students, and it turns out that it literally doesn't work. Backwards messages and songs are complete nonsense. That even if you did deliberately put backwards messages into songs, they had no effect on people whatsoever. Your brain literally does not pick up on backwards messages, just as they do not pick up on subliminal messages played forwards. And uh, one final study that was done that I thought was really very interesting was uh, essentially done by the Department of Justice. What they did was they did a they did they did an experiment where they tried out using subliminal messaging on retail workers to try to program them to not steal from work. And they found that it essentially had no effect. They, they, they believe that it might have had some effect on someone who was already predisposed to a certain behavior. Like someone who was already likely not to steal might have been already further not going to steal. But other than that, there was essentially no effect on them whatsoever. But in that study, there is a, a very interesting statement. Subliminal, both sub-audible and sub-visual messages should be tried in retail businesses to help prevent employee theft and shoplifting, given their probable effectiveness and the absence of any legal or ethical arguments against them. That's a very frightening thought to me that this is something the Department of Justice thought was okay. They're basically telling companies, go ahead and try and program your employees' behavior without their permission. They're essentially saying, go ahead and try to program their minds without telling them. And what an utter violation of humanity this actually is. They, well, they suppose that there was no law against it. There was no legal definition of this being unethical, but the idea of programming someone's behavior 
without their permission as not being ethical is is frankly astounding and it, it, it's a very frightening statement to listen to such a powerful bureaucracy such as the as the department of justice to actually put out now in this movie we find that in the end the tyler durden character is a delusion by the the narrator it's an alternate personality which exists within his own mind now in in, in real life we call this a disassociative identity disorder which was previously called you know split personality disorder that's uh that's an outdated term extremely rare this is something that that basically almost never happens so to, to even come across this is like something like like a one in a million chance that's how exceedingly rare it actually is but again this is a movie so it's not going to be all that of an accurate representation of what the illness is actually like uh, so having said that the the way that it's portrayed in this movie is really not accurate at all uh, in fact i would say that it's basically nonsense this it's completely ridiculous uh it is common for the not too not too common but it, it's it's fairly frequent for the the sufferer of disassociative identity disorder to not know that the other personality is there but to have so many other people know that the other personality is there and for no one to tell that person that's just not believable I'm sorry, but in reality, there would have been a lot of people who would have told that person that they were there. And the, another thing that really sticks out to me that, uh, that this really is a Hollywood interpretation of mental illness is that the, the other personalities that show up in an illness like this, they're not per, they're, they're really not malicious. These uh, personalities show up after some kind of trauma that causes the person to disassociate from that trauma as a defense mechanism against what happened. These other personalities that show up are something that try to help the original person. They're, they're, they're there to help them. They're not there to trick them or to to cause them harm or end up creating a massive conspiracy against the modern world i mean that that whole aspect of it is is just so 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 far beyond reason it's absolutely it's absolutely ri ridiculous and it's not believable on any level whatsoever no fully cognitively functioning rational person would really be listening to an alternate personality that exists in someone else's mind that the original person doesn't know about and that the and then would follow the orders of the alternate personality to make sure that the original person doesn't know that they exist and then to try and stop them it, it's it it's it's so far-fetched, so completely out of whack of what we actually know how mental illness works. One. Another good uh, final point that I wanted to make was that there is in Hollywood a tendency to very much link mental illness to violence, and this simply just isn't the case. Uh, there is very little actual linking, actually very little of mental illness actually does correlate to violence. Uh, this is something that is uh, largely a public perception that is completely false, that has mostly been created by the media. Very little that actually relates to violence. Uh, most of the violence that, that does occur as a result of mental illness happens as a result of a delusional belief by a person that they are under attack or that uh, they are being held against their will, which usually is the case. Like they are, they are delusional and they are being, they are being held against their will, 
But in their minds, because they're delusional, they think it's part of something larger. They think it's a, a large conspiracy. Uh, they're being held because they're, they're not able to function. Uh, their, their thoughts are disorganized. Uh, their, their lives are in shambles. They can't take care of themselves. So they're being, they're, they're being held for their own good. But in their minds, it's a plot by the government or, or something else to take away their freedom. So they're acting out in, in self-defense, essentially from a, a threat that they perceive. It, it's not that they're being malicious. It's that they, they feel threatened. Uh, the, the, the threat isn't isn't actually there. So it's not that they're, they're being malicious and that they're, they're evil and that they have no compassion or sympathy or anything. It's because the, the, it's because they, they, they feel threatened and there's a big difference between the two. So that's going to do it for my thoughts on the movie Fight Club. I would recommend anybody who is really interested in that kind of thing to go ahead and watch it. Just uh, do keep in mind that its portrayal of mental illness really is not accurate whatsoever. And also, to, also do keep in mind that Tyler Durden is not the good guy. He is actually the villain, which is why he shows up on the villain wiki. There's a uh, good reason for that. Thank you for watching. If you like this program, then please head over to my Patreon page and set up a monthly donation. It's your donations that keep this program running. Also, if you would like, please rate, comment, subscribe, and share in various social media.